Hello and welcome to a special Masters with Masters. We're filming at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and uh, many of the, the great missions and programs that we have as an agency have taken place here. I'm Ed Hoffman, the Chief Knowledge Officer, uh, and I'll be the host uh, for the discussion today. I really want to start by thanking uh, our guest at JPL and specifically our Chief Knowledge Officer here, David Oberheadinger. Uh, the Knowledge uh, Specialist, Min Lee, as well as the Public Relations Team and NASA TV for making this possible. We also have uh, a small uh, guest here who uh, have been asking uh, some good questions. I so thank you for taking the time. We're streaming it across JPL, and it's also being recorded, so it will be available for use in many of the programs that we do. These sessions are intended to provide a communication format for us to share some of the lessons we have, some of the most challenging miss missions that we have taking place by pulling together distinguished practitioners who can share some of their lessons and some of their insights. Uh, the sessions are also designed to be interactive, so we'll get questions from the audience and uh, through the different questions. And at this point, I'd like to uh, first of all thank uh, the distinguished uh, guests that we have here today, and I'll do a quick introduction because we want to get into the discussion. Uh, first of all, we have Richard Cook, who joined JPL in 1989, working first in the mission design section and conducting trajectory design activities on the Magellan mission to Venus. He was the Mars Pathfinder mission manager and was responsible for operating the first ro rover, Sojourner, on the surface of Mars in 1997. He's held several roles in the Mars Exploration Rover Project, which landed Spirit and Opportunity Rovers in 2004, and was the flight system manager and project manager um, for that. Richard now works as the deputy uh, director for the Solar System Exploration Organization and recent re recently received the Astronautics Engineering Award for Engineering Leadership. He has a list of many awards uh, and for the sake of time we'll just thank you for being here. Thank you. We also have David Lehman who is the project manager for the Mars Odyssey Orbiter. He previously was the project manager responsible for GRAIL which is Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory which had as its goal to determine the structure of the lunar interior crust to Cora. He was the project manager for Deep Space One, a technology validation mission, and he's been with NASA for over 33 years, serving in a variety of roles in programs, projects, as well as helping to look and uh, to develop the policy requirements for the missions that we have in place today. He's been involved in my Mars Micro Mission, the Mars Surveyor Orbiter, Solar Probe, Astrobiology Explorer, and has received numerous uh, achievements and, and awards, as well as the Aviation Week and Space Technology uh, Laurels Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Field of Space. Thank you both uh, for joining us. And I think uh, uh, a natural starting point is how did you get started at JPL uh, in terms of your career? And uh, what, what stood out in terms of how did you get here? How did you get started? And I'll, I'll start with, with you, Richard. How did you get to JPL in terms of the early work you were doing. Well, I won't start with as a small child. How's that? I'll, I'll try to give you the, con the, con yeah, the, right, the condensed <laughs> yeah. version. Um, you know, I, I would actually like to say that I'm one of those people that saw the, the moon landing or the Viking landing when I was five years old and said, someday I'm going to work at JPL, and that's how I got here. But, uh, but it wasn't true, actually. I was just kind of a person growing up that had a general set of interests in all kinds of different things, math and science and history. Uh, but I think the thing that tied it kind of all together was just a strong sense of curiosity and desire to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And that, that, you know, as I got into college and, and uh, got exposed to, in particular, I went to the University of Colorado and got exposed to a lot of, uh, of areas involving space, um, I realized that that was an area where there was a lot of interesting problems to be solved and where a person who had that curious nature could, could get opportunities to do some pretty unique things. And so I just ended up going to, to, uh, to school there and then at Texas for a while before coming to JPL and have just sought out here while I've been here the opportunities to be part of mission teams to be able to, because I'm intrigued by the ability to ask and answer some really hard questions and, uh, and also to work with a lot of really smart people together on a collective effort. I think that's a unique aspect of what we do here is the fact that we're all, um, in a sense, reliant on each other to kind of ask and answer these very difficult questions. 
to. The initial spark for you was having a place that has a lot of problems. That's right. And challenges. <laughs> yeah, challenge. Yeah, challenge. That's, that's a way to view it. But also uh, um, where the problems have a, um, you know, I'm not going to, to sort of uh, put it down or anything, but it, the problems are big enough that they require a major concerted effort to try to solve and, and that, that it's not a do something this month and then do it again the month after that and, and kind of repetitive. It's a, it truly is once in a lifetime or once in a very decade sort of opportunities to do these things. Yeah, and the long missions that require expertise from all over the world, literally. That's right. Um, so, uh, David, I'd ask you the same question. How did you get started and what were you, the key points in terms of your career uh, as you look back? Well, prior to coming to JPL, I was in the Navy. I was a nuclear submarine and I was intrigued by all the engineering problems involved with that, but it was a little too much staying under the water for so long. And so I decided after a bunch of interviews to come here at JPL, and instead of looking down, I'm looking up. And, but I really liked the engineering, and the focus I had in the beginning was engineering, engineering, and engineering. And, uh, but after about five or six years of that, I, I, I started working on different project teams and getting involved with management. And so I, I really enjoy the, the project management aspects of the missions. My first, uh, um, I think, important step in that was working on Mars Pathfinder. Richard and I worked together on that. Uh, I worked on the avionic systems for that, and uh, that was a real joy for me. I met a lot of interesting people, interesting project managers through that, and, th and that was a springboard for me to uh, to go into to more project management roles. So the starting point, similar uh, to Richard, is the the engineering challenges and uh, the the things that you have to to overcome. And what advice, maybe, to someone who's starting? now at, at JPL or, or who's not you know, even at NASA, but someone who's interested in taking on great engineering challenges or, or space type missions. How do you, how do you get into I, this? I think, I think uh, to me, the focus should be f for an engineering and then teamwork, all right? Sure. I mean, you've got to work with teams. For our missions here at JPL, everything revolves around the team. And uh, so you just can't be a one-sided person Okay, you just focus on your own little world. If, if you want to get involved with project management, with engineering, big projects like, like, uh, like Richard's had, had here. So that, that's what I think you should be doing. So really immerse yourself in the technical excellence, the technical engineering, but also the ability to work with others. Sure. Yeah, and to reach out. I mean, I think that, that, that what Dave um, was talking about is exactly right. Real, and in particular on the Pathfinder project was you know, my first exposure to a project team and, and in that sense where you know, you certainly had everybody with their little piece of the job, but they also were looking out to, you know, the people they interface to and they worked with, you know, what are their problems? How do I help solve their problems? You know, what is the way to, um, to work together to kind of on a common, on a common goal? And, and that's, again, what the mission teams are, are about, first and foremost, is trying to get to launch or get to the to landing or whatever the mission is about. And I think that, that if you... If you're comfortable working in that kind of an environment, or or is it's it's great to come to a place like this because it'll give you a chance to do that. If you if you want to be in a little box where you ha you know you just do kind of your same thing over and over again, you know then, then that's not necessarily something we do. Yeah, I want to ask uh, you both about mentors because walking around JPL as a guest, one of the things that always you know is amazing to me is that there's always something just cool that's taking place. I mean, just you know, Earth. Uh, earth shaking to a certain extent with the missions, the programs. You can look back in terms of the history, you can look forward. And so there's obviously people who are involved in this. Um, in terms of getting started, or, or even now, are there certain people that played a key role in terms of sure. mentoring oh, yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, the, the Pathfinder project manager, Tony Spear, is a, a great example, probably for Dave as well, of, of, of a person who was you know, phenomenally good at creating a team. Right. I mean, it was not necessarily the technical expert on on everything. In fact, it would be the first person to tell you that he wasn't. You know, was usually, in his opinion, not the smartest person in the room by a long shot. But but in that ability to to enroll people and then get them to do their job, and also to recognize that it, their job just didn't end at at you know the boundaries of their little piece, but that they needed to be part of this bigger team. He was, you know, a great mentor in that regard, and really was a, a way to you know taught me how to. To, to be part of a team and to, and to function that way. 
Pete Tysinger, project manager on MER as well, very much the same. And, and recognizing that, 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 you know, as much as the engineering challenge of what we're doing is, is very significant, is obviously the hard part, the management and, and personal challenge of organizing a team of people to accomplish a common goal in some ways is even harder because it's, it's here on the ground, right? I mean, it's things that you can't pick up and look around and, and do failure analysis of or anything like, I mean, in, in the same ways. It, it requires a much different set of skills. And so both those guys, I think, had mastered that, that sort of sense of how do you put teams together and how do you get them to move in the right direction. And it's certainly the mentors that I would look you back on. Do you continue to look for mentors, or do you get to a point where? Oh, sure. Now yeah. You're, you're no, there. no. And, and it, you know, as you do different jobs, you, you have, um, you know, right now I work for Farouz Naderi, who's, who's the director of the Solar System Exploration, and is a very strategic view of the way the agency works and the, and the laboratory works and, and how to do program definition. And so certainly, yeah, at, at every job you have, there are people who, who are masters at it and who can and certainly are good people to emulate. What about you, David? Who are some of your mentors that? Well, Richard brought up Tony Spear, the Mars Pathfinder project manager. And I just remember what he used to always tell all the junior engineers is everybody has to be a system engineer. You can't just work on your own engineering problem. You have to system engineer the whole aspect of it and try to look outside your little area so you understand what's going on big picture wise. So he was he was a great inspiration for me. Another one was probably uh, here at JPL, the engineer of engineers, uh, Joe Savino. He's one of the chief engineers for avionics. And, and I learned a lot from him engineering wise and, and how he built teams, all right? And so that was, that was very good for me. And then later on, uh, I latched on the fellow by the name of John Cassani who to me is the is the project manager of project manager. He is the role model for me. Okay, he was the project manager for Voyager, uh, Galileo, Cassini, and he's still my mentor. All right. I'm, in fact, I'm having dinner with him tomorrow night. And so he, he I learned a lot from him on, on how to manage these projects. Right. And in terms of advice for getting mentors, did, did you aggressively seek out certain people and say, hey, I want to work with you, or, or, or did it just happen? It just happened for me. me too. It was no <laughs> okay, so. foresight or or strategic thinking at all. I think if you get onto a project teams, that's when you get the opportunity to meet a lot of these yeah. folks. It's hard yeah. to to do it otherwise because it's you know to get enough exposure to them day in and day out. I think it, you really have to be part of the team that they're they're on in a way. If I came up to somebody and says, "Can I be your be your mentor?" or the other way around, I would probably be laughed at. <laughs> so so that didn't work out that way for me. Right, so the, the informal ways of working and right. seeing mm -hmm. who, you, right. who you want to emulate and be with. What about your role in terms of mentoring others? Do you look to do that? Or yeah, are you yeah definitely, and, and you know, I do, it's interesting the pattern of project execution, you know, after having done it three or four times now, you know, you can kind of feel like the problems are, I mean, they're always different, but there's a character to them that, that you just like, oh yeah, this is a similar situation as what I, you know, experienced on MER or on Pathfinder or whatever, and so, but you also want to, to, to learn how, it, even learning the skill of being a mentor is a, is a good one as well, because you know, it's very easy to say, well, this is the way we did it on Pathfinder or whatever. And, and I don't, I think that that's, uh, in the end, that's your knee-jerk reaction, but in the end, not necessarily the most effective route because people are, after a while, sort of tune you out because their problems are different or they, they don't necessarily, I mean, you have to kind of have been in that spot to understand why they're, you know, why it's applicable. And so you have to kind of, in a sense, more get people to realize and to, you know, kind of approach the problem however they want to and then just try to steer them as well as you can. Having the, I'm in the position now where several project managers reporting to me, and, and that's my experience so far, is that it's just been an interesting one of, of, of you know, saying, well, it's similar to a problem we have, but what is, you know, how is it different from what you're doing? And, and it, it's a challenge. It's something that I think that, that, that now it makes me appreciate guys who did it before me even that much more, because I never felt like they were telling me how to do things. They were more trying to get me to learn how to do it on my own. What about you, David? Do you? Uh, I think Richard hit the nail on the head. Is is what, what he said. And so, you know, my job as a project manager who's been around for a while is to try to do the best I can for the the people under me to to get ready to take over my job as soon as possible. And so that that's one of my focuses right now. One of the things I uh, you know, you're taken with is the nature of the missions that are done here are 
the definition of complex. They go over decades, uh, there's international part partnerships, there's industry, there's multiple centers, there's a lot that, that's going on. And so you probably have both a balancing act between being able to move out and stay on schedule, but also make sure that people can voice their disagreements or basically you know, uh, you know, the, the balance between uh, diversity uh, if I disagree with you, this is what we should be doing versus getting unity going in a direction. You know, how do you create an environment uh, that is open, that is sharing, where people are comfortable being honest, uh, and, uh, but also going in a direction? Well, it's interesting because JPL has, a, you know, I mean, kind of a, 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 in a, in a sense, a reputation of having that open uh, sort of culture. And I think part of it is because we're a little bit of the Italian family where we all kind of yell at each other all the time, you know, in, in all ways. I mean, both, you know, from the top down and the bottom up. And, and I think that, that, you know, that comes across, particularly when dealing with outside organizations, sometimes a little strange, you know, where it's like, why are these guys so asking so many hard questions or, or vice versa? But I think it's a... It's a, that's, you know, that culture of, of openness is one that you get from the very top and you have to reinforce it time and time and time again. And, and you know, I certainly have a lot of examples that I would give, but one of the key groups at JPL that is kind of core to the, that openness is, is what I would call, I kind of call the non-commissioned officer group, that there's a set of senior level technical people at JPL that, and Joe Savino is an example of one, there's others as well, who have worked here on project after project for 20 or 30 years or more. And they're extremely well respected at this place. I mean, to the point where, you know, from a, the highest levels of management, you know, the director, you know, would, would consult those folks on technical problems or whatever. And, and I remember three of them in particular worked on, on MER and a few days before landing of, of Spirit, we found a, a technical problem. And, and Rob Manning and Jim Donaldson and Glenn Reeves are three of the very senior technical folks and basically came to the project, Pete Tysinger and I, and said, we need to make a change. And, you know, we basically said, you know, went through the, trying to understand what the problem was and eventually decided to go ahead and make the change. But then we went and had that had those guys brief, you know, not only Tom Gavin, who was the associate director at the time, but Charles Alachi was the director, as well as as Ed Weiler, who was the associate administrator. And it was, and those guys were the ones who basically said, "This is what we think the right thing to do," and and felt like they could make that statement to the management of the laboratory without being told to no, you know, we don't need, you know, we're two days away from landing, you know, be quiet, you know, we don't want to hear your comments. And so it's those kind of examples where they're they're treated with a, a great deal of reverence, I think, that creates in this place that kind of atmosphere of so openness. It's a, it's a history of a leadership that sounds like it demands it an openness, uh, as well as there's a comfort level, it sounds like, for uh, yelling and arguing. That's right. And that, dissent. That, that dissent. That's right. And uh, that's necessary. Uh, any thoughts in terms of, uh, we know in the NASA history there are examples of success happens by that kind of diverse exchange, but also we've had failures where it seemed like we were constrained. Any thoughts on, on the, I know that part of your background is you've worked on the uh, NASA uh, policy and guidance in terms of, of missions. So any thoughts on well, that? Well, I, I resonate with, with what Richard said and uh, about the culture that's, that's alive here, here at JPL. And my advice to, to uh, managers here at, at JPL, a future project manager is is have an open door policy, uh, be inclusive. Like for example, say you're you're trying to make a key decision, and you know it's controversial, and there's a few people who don't like what you you think they don't like what you're doing. And you say, well, I won't invite them to this meeting, and that'll make it easier for this decision to be made. Don't do that. That is a bad example of what you should be doing. So you want to be inclusive to all the people, all the parties who have a, have a role in what's going on. And, and you want to have this open door policy. And uh, everything you can do to, to uh, communicate to your team an openness to get, to get the team doing what you need to get done is, is I think, what you should focus on. Right, yeah, that, that importance of communications and uh, exactly, if you keep someone out, once they find that out, then uh, Right, it's then easy to make a controversial, controversial decision if you exclude some people who are a key party of that. And you don't want to do that. 
And you know, we were talking about Tony Spear before. I mean, I remember on Pathfinder we had the, you know, one of his things was to, to pick the most difficult review board mm -hmm. you possibly can find. Get all the curmudgeons, all the guys that, that are the difficult, and get them on your review board because that way you're going to get it point blank, right? I mean, they're going to they're going to you're you know they're going to tell you what they think, but if you can answer their questions. And first, you'll make yourself better, you'll make your product better, and you'll enlist them in what you're trying to do. You'll, you'll make them part of the team. And so, I mean, we had on our Pathfinder review board, it was chaired by Jim Martin, who was the Viking project manager, who here he's coming from, you know, this great, you know, amazing success in the 70s, and we're going to try to do it for, you know, one twentieth the, the money. And so he was just totally skeptical, you know, for the first two years. But by the time we landed, he was the greatest ally the project had. It was really great at... And not only helping us out, but convincing all of NASA that we knew what we were talking about. And that open skepticism is a positive. That's right. Because it makes you have to. That's right. It makes it, you perform. To, to be better. Yeah. Um, interest in the balance between managing risk uh, as well as being able to be innovative. So you're partly in the business in any mission that you do. You want it to be successful. You want to use practices that you've learned to reduce risk. Uh, you also, however, are in the in, uh, exploration business, mm -hmm. not just of science, but also of management approaches, doing things, you know, cheaper. Right. Um, so how do you figure out that balance? Is that something that when you start a mission, you start talking about innovation vis-a-vis uh, -vis risk, or is it something that uh, you, you figure out as you go? I'm a little of both. I mean, we struggle with that, to be honest, right? I mean, we're, we, we uh, I think that our... You know, at times the agency and JPL both, you know, react to failure by adding and, and by adding process, by adding oversight, by adding, um, you know, more control over things, which which stifles innovation. You know, certainly mission pull. I mean, when you you know you the, what the missions need in terms of innovation is a huge enabler to having it occur. And and it, for example, with Skycrane on MSL, I mean, we you know absolutely that's obviously a very innovative system. This clearly a case where, but it was necessary for the mission. And because of that, at the beginning, you know, we identified it as something that that we needed to to make happen. And that's a case where we enlisted the world. And, and make it sure it was the right thing to do. I mean, we won over all the skeptics one by one, and you know, for something like that that's so obviously visible and 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 um, you know, a scaled up of, of MSL, you need to do that. I think other cases, you know, like we're working on you know CubeSats and other things where they're very small. Part of that goes back to the Pathfinder model, which is to give these guys a space and a little cocoon in which they can actually do something kind of cool without fear of having to. To have to respond to every, you know, uh, oversight uh, thing that the agency or that the, the center can think of, and so we need to do both of those things, right? We need to be able to innovate at a big scale and have, you know, kind of fully embrace the process to get, you know, to get it done. And in other cases, I think we need to shelter the, the these little ger these little seeds from, you know, the 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 oversight in order to get them to be able to try something and accept that failure will occur. In some of those cases, and just you know, use that as a learning opportunity. Yeah, you have to be able to accept if failure happens, because once you stomp down, then you lose any bit of innovation. You you lose the right. credibility and there. Because I think in the end, the, while the process is important, the training of the people that you're getting through failure, first and foremost. I mean, I was on Mars '98, and so I certainly had that experience firsthand. You know, that was a, a, a searing <laughs> experience for all involved in terms of learning, you know, what not to do. And I think that that, that you know, obviously it'd be nice not to lose, you know, two spacecraft on their way to Mars to get that experience. But it's something that, 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 that adding process in response to it is not necessarily the right answer. Yeah. So. But also you, you allude to the fact that if you look at the history, certainly JPL, the missions you're doing today learned from what they came did. before. They did. And you get better. Uh, David, you've been in answering this risk and innovation approach both as a project manager and as a leader but also putting together policy guidance for how do you do effective uh, management of missions. How do you approach that, uh, that balance uh, or how should a project manager try to approach uh, figuring out the right amount of risk and discipline vis-a-vis -vis the adaptive innovative approach? Well, the way I'd answer that is uh, right after Mars uh, Pathfinder I was assigned to be project manager of Deep Space One. All right, and the purpose of that mission was to validate a whole bunch of new, uh, new technologies and validate them in space. And back in those days, this is, 
I just had barely heard what risk management was about. But uh, I was told, okay, we're going to develop all these technologies. It's okay if it fails because we're going to be launching so many other missions that nobody will notice. And so uh, I was ex-military. I saluted and said, that's what we're going to do. And so we, we tried to do that. All right. And so about a year before launch, a whole new set of managers came in to oversee the, the project. And they said, you're doing what? And so uh, we had to revisit all of our risk trades on all these new technologies, and we had to work like crazy. And luckily, I don't know how, but by some miracle, we were able to, to launch those technologies. So this was the first time um, ion propulsion was ever used to go any place. We had uh, autonomous navigation, deep space radio, small deep space radio. And so that is, to me, one extreme, all right? This is right around the same time as, as Mars 98. And from that, that's where I learned that risk management is important because by the time you, you get ready for launch, everything has to, everything is really class A, regardless of what it was in the beginning. And so you've got to have this balance, okay? You want to be innovative. You want to take risks. You want to do a lot of stuff for a little bit of money in a short period of time. But it, you have to to look at the balance a bit, bit between those. As, as far as 7120 goes, uh, uh, that one, that's where I learned a lot about uh, risk management in, in the developing that document. And so I was able to apply that to, to my uh, other projects after, after leaving, working on that. Right, so the, the policy there serves as accumulated wisdom, but it's still ultimately up to the team and the project to be able to, uh, to, to tailor. To, to the appropriate situation. Right, right. The, yeah. That document, it, it focuses on on what needs to be done, all right, not not the how. Right. But what it does say is use your common sense, right. all right? And to me, common sense is having a balance between a lot of risk and, and making sure you launch on time, and, and it works. Because I sometimes hear, particularly uh, folks early in their career, they, they're looking for, this is the cookbook, but you know, as a, no as a project no leader, you have book. to adapt and you're using this as guidelines. One of the questions uh, we have from the, the audience here gets into this question of risk, and it goes, you can't plan for every risk, or can you? Uh, and how do you prepare for the unexpected? So a large part of the, the missions you're involved in, there, there's a high degree of unexpected. So how do, you, how do you approach risk from that standpoint? Well, I mean, I think you, you, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of a trite expression or whatever, but you're, you are going to get the unexpected. You, you need to prepare for the unexpected by expecting it, right? I mean, that you need to build a, a system and a team that is responsive to the kinds of problems that you can imagine and even some that you can't and that, that is exposed to enough problems that they, they sort of build the resiliency muscle by use, right? I mean, that they, 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 they learn how to deal with failures with a little f, you know, not big failures, but little failures, so that then they, when they run into real challenges, they, they know how to act and they know how to behave. And it's, you know, through training as part of it, but I also think it's by just directly, you know, having that experience. And, and certainly there's legion of examples of those on Pathfinder and, and MER parachute failures, you know, out in the desert. And, and I think one of the things that management can do best in those cases is not to overreact. Right, I mean, it's very easy to, to, particularly if you've seen it before, to say, okay, well, this is going to lead to that, and we're going to have problems, and the money, and just to sort of start to speculate and go down the, the chain of all the bad things that can begin can begin to happen. I think having that 24-hour rule, or 48 hours, or two months, or however long it needs to be, to avoid reacting, you know, in a way that keeps the team from doing what they think is the right thing to do technically. That that's the first place to go is what's the solution, give them an opportunity to think of it, don't, don't over specify you know, the response. Make, them cl make it clear that, it's, that, that a response is required but without having them um, kind of looking to you to be the person to establish that, what the specifics are. And like if you're sailing and you get into trouble, you don't want to keep doing Things that that, yeah. that make you oversteering on the right. ice, right, is another right. one. So yeah, right. Uh, any other thoughts in terms of of that risk, or I think you talked about. I, I think that's I when you the learned. Question before. Yeah, I, I I learned from the school of hard knocks on uh, Deep Space One of what to do and what not to do. Right. In terms of another question, in terms of managing the project flow, uh, what's the best strategy for communication? 
to me, when in doubt, over communicate. Okay. All right, you can never communicate enough. Okay, and uh, documenting what you do, uh, having uh, good procedures, having good requirements. I think that, that that's the most important thing. Like on the, the Grail project, we hired a, a very senior uh, engineer, uh, Duncan McPherson. He was in charge of our requirements, and they were very complex to translate gravity into what engineers could build. All right, and and that that to me is an example of communicating. How do you translate these strange requirements having to do with gravity into uh, engineering terms so engineers can 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 build your spacecraft? And so that, that to me is the focus, is communication. I would say too that, that, that the, I mean, I agree with the over communication, but in particular it's important in talking with, the, with your management, right? That, I mean, it's a way to build confidence, you know, in the people that you work for. And, and you know, they talk about managing your management, right? I mean, nothing as a project manager, it, there's a tendency to want to say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this information, whatever it might be, from, the, from my management because I don't want them to react or whatever. I mean, to, you, you know, solve it before. Someone, exactly. Right. I think, you know, that, and a, particularly a lesson from Pete, right, is just, Tysinger, is just to say everything, mm -hmm. right? Because, it, I mean, yes, they'll, in some cases, overreact. Right. Most of the time, you don't get to be senior management in the agency or, or, or at JPL without you know, having some experience in what's happened in the world. And so those guys typically don't. And I think what it does is it builds in them a, a confidence that you're, you're open, you know, that you're, that you're telling them what's going on. And I think if you instill that in your folks as well, it's like, I'm not going to overreact. Just tell me what's going on. It creates that information flow up and down very well. And, and, it, and it makes everybody feel like they can tell, tell you things without having you overreact. And you demonstrating that by taking them to their, you know, with you when you go to management, you know, is a way to get everybody seeing that you're actually following the behavior you suggest. Yeah. Well, you get earn a trust level because people know they you're going to say what's going on, right. as opposed to maybe we can't, you know, can't believe in this person. Right. Uh, one of the questions that we have gets into the technology and the pace how it changes. Uh, and, and, and the issues of innovation, and yet you have a project flow. Many of these missions go for decades. And the question is along the lines of, so you're in, you know, you, you're in, the, uh, in a program, and there's a significant breakthrough technology, uh, or it could be a breakthrough in terms of uh, management approach. How do you deal with that uh, when you're, I mean, are you, do you get to a point where you're locked in and yeah, we see these the, these breakthroughs, and they'd be great, but we're too far gone. Or can you adapt to? It tremendous depends. I mean, in some usually, you, I would think in most of the projects I've been on, you get to a point where it's very hard to kind of roll in new things. From a process point of view, you can, you know, on the ground, particularly you know, with how the team functions, even into operations, or on the case of software, you know, changes on the on the surface for for rovers and things. We've done that. Um, I think that it that. You know, the only thing I, I think about when I'm doing that is that we've invested a lot in this asset that we have, whatever it be, you know, on the surface of Mars or, you know, getting ready for launch or, or even the team. And you have to be a little bit careful of not kind of chasing after the latest thing because, you know, whatever it, it is, uh, because the team, you know, needs some consistency in, in what we're trying to achieve. And I think, you know, there's there's sort of a punctuated kind of model I think that makes the best sense where you know you're like okay we're gonna do that we're gonna make it to this point using the capabilities we have and then now is maybe a good opportunity you know and, and that's certainly been the case with the rovers on the surface of Mars you know we've gotten to a certain point of, of performance on the surface now let's reconsider whether or not we can add in some new capabilities and then at that point it's like a new development right start from the beginning Add in new functions, make sure you verify them correctly, and, and go about it the way that, that we normally do. Okay. So the significant breakthroughs have to happen at the very beginning. And once you get past a certain point, new missions can, can then accommodate so. these breakthroughs. I think so. Right. Yeah, on, on Deep Space One, we had examples with uh, technologies that were, there was a lot of work done, a lot of work invested, like the iron propulsion. And that was able to flow into the project, and it, it, it even though there are a lot of difficulties, it was it was it happened. But then we had two others. One was a, a new computer system. Uh, it was called a 3D stack, 
And these people really wanted to get it into our mission. They really wanted to get into the mission. But we were worried that they may not make it. So we had a backup, which was the Mars, Mars Pathfinder computer. And unfortunately, it, it just didn't happen. We had some technology reviews. They didn't pass. So we had a backup for that. And uh, it was very complex process to get this change made w within JPL and, and the agency, but, but having a backup for, for these new technologies at least helped us in this one regard. So we had sort of a cushion just in case it didn't quite make it. So you have to have a plan, you have to also stick to it because you bring in the fact that you have stakeholders mm -hmm. who they may want to go in a different direction. Right. And so, right. um, so you, you, you've had an incredible career, both of you, 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 you total close to 60 years probably of experience. Are you I that old? To, I, I didn't know you were that old, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I just started. I hate to um, think about that. Yeah. <laughs> what are the core lessons uh, that you bring now to a, to a mission or to an organization uh, that, that you'd share with us? What are the... Well, I mean, I think one of them, and we talked on it, touched on it at the beginning, is that is to, to search for the, the, the or t to value the strength of your team. I mean, you need to... to it's a trite expression again, but you, you're only going to go as far as the quality of the folks you have. And and I think at JPL we're blessed, at the agency we're blessed to have a lot of very capable folks. You know, part of the job of management is to give them an opportunity to, to show how great they are and to kind of, in some ways, get out of the way. And I'm that's still a pathfinder, you know, sort of, a, I, I think I still have that in my mind, that, that the role of management, among others, one of the chief ones is to shield the people who make it happen uh, and give them an opportunity to make it happen. And, and you know, having said that, they sometimes, you know, struggle and, and are, you know, get, uh, don't, you know, know which way to go or whatever. And so you need to have, you know, you need to figure out, do you have you constructed the team the right way so that they, that you're making the best of the people you have? Have you put them in the right spots? Have you given them, um, you know, some cases people are better at, at working, you know, in a systems environment, some people are better at being, you know, in their office focused on a particular task or whatever. And that, you know, really going through and being a judge of people is the challenge of project management. In my mind, the, the main lesson is, you know, how good are you at able, at, at recognizing the strengths and weaknesses of people? It's like a coach of a, of a team. And, you know, that's, you know, why is Phil Jackson great at, at being an NBA coach? It's not because he knows basketball better than anybody else, it's because he knows people or basketball people. players better than anybody else and is able to bring out their strengths and weaknesses in a way that is unique. And, and I think that that's true of management. The number of times when, you know, uh, Pete Tyson, you always would say on, on MER, the number of times when I actually, when he actually had to say, do this, was maybe five times over the course of the project, right? I mean, almost all cases, you know, the team would come in and say, this is the right thing to do. And he would say, yeah, you, you know, you made the right decision because I orchestrated it so that you would make the right decision. I mean, you know, that, that, that's what you, you try to set it up so that the right decisions are made. The team. So when you think of team, um, obviously you're thinking of the, the folks you have at JPL, but a typical mission you have is going to have international partners, oh, yeah. right. uh, supply Absolutely. chain from industry, headquarters, scientists, safety. How do you, how do you work the, those kinds of stakeholders? Is, this, is it the same kind of a thing? It's the or? same. It's the same, and it's different, right? I mean, it's the same in the sense that that recognizing their skills and enrolling them. You know, a, a, a wonderful. Uh, collaboration that that I had with you know on both MSL and Pathfinder MER it was Lang with the Langley folks in the entry descent landing team, and you know from the very beginning of that it's been you know amazingly uh, collaborative in terms of recognizing the strengths and they bring to the to the to the equation to the team and and valuing that and they also are get amazingly invested in the in the project right I mean they're not just there to help with aerodynamics or whatever but to recognize that driving around on the surface of Mars is what those those missions are about and so enrolling folks from wherever they work in the team at in industry wherever that they are you know international is is absolutely critical you also have to recognize that there are cultural <laughs> differences sure. between these different organizations and I mentioned already that yeah that the JPL has a kind of a culture of being very kind of, uh, you know, 
antagonistic or whatever in, in reviews and things. I've been working now on a project where you know we have a lot of interaction with the, with the European space uh, community, and they have a different approach, and it, and it works for them, you know, and it but and it's just interesting when it interacts with us, and we need to be sensitive to that fact that it's different. And when we have these joint projects, you almost have to talk about that at the beginning, right? It's like, yeah, you know, you're, you know, you know the way we are, you know, or you don't know the way we are. This is how we approach reviews. This is how we approach, you know, dissent and things like that. How do you guys do that? And fortunately in the case now, we've worked with a lot of these organizations and they kind of are beginning to get some clue how we operate and vice versa. And so we're learning, you know, each other's skills. I think that's the only way you can really form an effective team is to actually have the experience and see how they react under stress, you know, under pressure of reviews or, or failures or whatever. So. Yeah, to work together, you build that, that kind of a team. We, we have an example in the International Project Management course where we, we train together. Right. We have NASA people, we have different partners coming together. So the collaboration, it just has to be extended, mm -hmm. I think is what, what, what you're saying. Um, one of the questions that we have gets into this vein of lessons learned. There's been a lot of uh, discussions about knowledge. How effectively are we a learning organization? Uh, how do we effectively do we share? This has been something that's been here for, for obviously decades, as long as I've been around. And a question goes at, how do you encourage project teams to be reflective and to share knowledge during projects? And obviously the trade-off is, I need to do my engineering, I need to stay on schedule, I need to do the work I'm doing. I don't have yeah, time to take very, 50 minutes out to, difficult to do, to do this. It's, that's incredibly difficult to do, but what you can do is, is encourage people to write their lessons learned as you, as you go along. And for sure, at the end of the projects, is, it's, it's basically a JPL requirement that every engineer should write his lessons learned. The projects write a lessons learned document. Uh, writing uh, journal articles, like for Ask Magazine, I was been asked a couple times to do that on Grill. I haven't done it yet, okay, but one of these days I'll get, I'll get around we don't to go it. Away. <laughs> and uh, a, a conference briefing, giving right. briefings at conferences, going to other other NASA centers or other uh, with the with the military who's also doing uh, space satellites. The, you want to encourage your team to do that, but it is difficult to do in the middle of the project. The to document. It's very difficult. Yeah, I think also, you know, one of the places where, where I think we don't, um, I think recognizing that it is hard to, to uh, you know, have projects sort of go out during the middle of the project execution and, and do a lot of this is to have, you know, the observer community that, that, that you know, line management at JPL or other, other parts of the laboratory that's there to sort of build the capabilities of the institution we need to be more proactive about engaging them in the reviews we do, in the meetings we have, you know, where decisions are made about, about key things. And we tend to be, the project teams tend to be very insular in that regard, where the, except for reviews. Uh, but I think that's something that, that we could do better at, right? To, to basically include a, a broader group of people in the decision-making meetings we have. You know, as long as they're there in an observation sort of a mo mode, I think that would certainly be a feasible thing to do. Is it typical when you're at the beginning phase of a mission that you'll go to other centers to see what their experiences are with technology or with contractors, or is that, or is it typically you're you're starting? To be honest, probably we don't do it enough, and I I think that it's you know it's an interesting um, you know because right now we're in the process of talking about competing for the next discovery round of missions and things, and and I think. You know, the balance of competition right. versus collaboration at the agency sort of waxes and wanes at times. And, and we, you know, we, we probably struggle with that a little bit more than, than we should. I think it's not until you get into a project team, like, you know, for example, with the, in the case of MSL, you know, I got to, to understand a lot more about Goddard by watching the way they implemented the SAM instrument. You know, but before that, you know, it's not, you don't really get to, to have as much in-depth conversation with them because because you're sort of in separate little silos, unfortunately, for, for doing some of these missions. So, right. I, I keep thinking about, I worked with John Cassani. He was the program manager for uh, Mars Prometheus, all right? And the, the goal was to try to uh, develop uh, nuclear energy for space, all right? And so I learned a lot from him. We visited maybe three or four different DOE labs. We visited every, every NASA center to get to get their, uh, the best from them, Ames, uh, Goddard, uh, 
Glenn, KSC. And so I learned a lot from him on, on we need to do that for these missions that are just way outside the box. And, and so like what Richard said, for other projects that aren't so big changes, we, we need to do a better, cho better job of being more inclusive with the other centers. It, it, as I talk to you, and I'm getting a signal we're coming towards the end, uh, it seems like you have great jobs and that you, uh, you have a lot of joy in terms of what you're doing. What do you love about being a leader? Because you start off technically, you're engineers and you're leading programs, you're leading organizations. What do you enjoy about the leadership aspect? Well, it's the same. I mean, it's interesting because now I think about it, it's the same thing that got me to JPL to begin with. It's the problems. curiosity and the oh. problems, okay. right? <laughs> it is. I mean, it's the you know, it's the how do you, yeah. you know, how do you get a team to, and an organization to function effectively to to because it's a different class of problems. It's not you know the circuit design. It's it's you know how do you get this these set of people to work together? How do you figure out strategically what's the best thing, you know, to to balance risk versus innovation, you know, or, or and and to manage all that. And it's as I said, much more people centric. And and that's the great thing about being a leader is that you get a chance to work with folks and and hopefully they solve the problems, right? I mean, it's very rarely the case that I solve problems. You know, it's more that by through them I'm able to, to accomplish something, and and that's the part I enjoy about it the yeah. most. So is, again, it's the problems, the challenge, but now it's a different, right? You know, kind of a challenge. David, what do you love about uh, leadership? Well, what I like about it is, as a project manager, uh, I can become, I can try to become an expert on pretty much any job I want. All right, you know, I'm the project manager, but you have all these good people working, working for you, working with you. And if you decide, oh, look at this, he's developing an ion engine. I'm going to go work with that fellow for a while to figure out how, the, how you actually build an ion engine. And so I really enjoyed getting the opportunity to do that, to work with engineers, to learn from them in my role as a project manager. It, it, that was a lot of fun for me. Yeah, the ability to be stretched and to learn through, right, through right. others. Uh, let me ask a final question uh, to both of you. What words of wisdom? would you impart on folks who are starting at JPL or starting at NASA, young professionals, people who are joining us, uh, in terms of just what, what you'd like them to know, advice or wisdom to a young professional? Be curious, you know, seek out hard problems. Um, don't be afraid to, to try things that you, will, you don't know how to do uh, and, and be ready to dust yourself off dust yourself off if you happen to fail in those things uh, but that in doing so you'll become a better person a better you know engineer a better leader well, like that, the importance of resilience because you're doing tough things you're everything isn't going to go perfect you can have a review that doesn't are you able to to feel good and move forward mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, I would say uh, try to seek out the senior engineers and managers working with you all right seek out those people and try to learn from them as best you can because they're going to be your future guide points. Excellent. Well, it's gone very extremely fast, and uh, it's definitely been worth getting up, uh, I guess, 3 o'clock in the morning to get down here and dealing with the, the traffic <laughs> and uh, a lot of, uh, lot of tremendous wisdom. And, uh, you know, the, the, the joy that you have in terms of the work you're doing, the contributions you've made to, to the world, I think, come through. And we appreciate uh, your time. So we thank uh, Richard. We thank David. Uh, thank, thank, thank the you. audience we have here. I uh, certainly want to thank the NASA TV folks and the Public Relations Office and, uh, again, the, the knowledge team of David Oberhedinger and Min Lee. And uh, thank you for joining us, and keep learning. Thank you. Thanks.